Chancellor, as well as Vice Chancellor. Acknowledgements to the University of Zululand Chairperson of Council, Ms. N. Kaluza, and of course the Acting Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Professor Mtoze, Acting Vice Chancellor Professor Nom Formo, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Professors Kunene and Professor Siepe. All members of the University Council who are present here and those who are watching this ceremony virtually. University executives with whom we are captaining the ship with as two deans of various faculties management committee members, members of the University Senate, members of the institutional forums and forum, our academic and support staff colleges, president of convocation, Mr. Nkwanyama, and members of convocation, as well as my fellow graduates. Good morning. I would like to address you this morning, with your permission, Chancellor, on the case for government intervention in the South African economy. This morning, I stand before you, Chancellor, first of all, to express my gratitude for inviting me to the University of Zululand to accept the award on, of the honorary doctoral degree in economics and commerce conferred upon me a few minutes ago. And secondly, to deliver the keynote address as the Dean has requested me to. I am particularly humbled by the generosity of the nominating committee and the University Council and all of you who made this possible for me. It is my understanding that an honors degree, particularly a doctoral honors degree, is the highest honor that a university can bestow on anyone. I would also like to take a moment to thank my parents and all those who have contributed to my development and influenced me in a variety of ways. And this includes my wonderful wife who is here today with us. Thank you very much. And my children who accompany me here and all my friends. A special thank you for those who helped me and helped to nurture me on Robben Island inside those prison cells where I entered as a teenager in the 1960s, lost in the passion for freedom from injustice. Many of those that nurtured me have since passed on to the next world. It is a pleasure to be here today and to be invited to address you, ladies and gentlemen, and an extraordinary privilege to receive this honorary doctorate from this outstanding institution. It struck me during my research to discover the fantastic service rendered by this institution to our republic and its citizens over the years. The University of Zululand has produced several outstanding citizens who have contributed immensely to the welfare and economy of this country. 
My life, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, has been one of active and consistent resistance against injustice as well as prejudice. First in the political arena and then later on in my life in the business sector. I have also lived a life of privilege and realized quite early that with privilege comes responsibilities. In choosing a topic this morning, I felt it would be important to deal about something that is topical. I have thought deeply about our country and the debates that are raging to find a lasting solution, particularly to our economic challenges. There are those who feel that government should play a more active role, and yet others feel that government should be less intrusive in the economy if we are to resolve our challenges. This reminds me of my own intensive discussions with President Mandela when we exchanged views on the role of government in a new South Africa shortly after he was released from Robben Island. I was but one of many business leaders that he was consulting with during that period. Prior to this, I had last seen President Mandela on Robben Island at the, what we call the Old Trunk Section in 1964 where some of us were kept. The choice of my topic this morning is the role of government in a developmental economy like ours. The role of government intervention in the economy has been debated amongst economic theorists and academic scholars since the 18th century. There are three main angles to this debate. The first was led by the classical theory pioneers such as Adam Smith, often referred to as the father of economics, and the likes of John Stuart Mill, who developed the ideas around economies of scale and opportunity cost, as well as comparative advantage in international trade policy. The fundamental principle of this school of thought is that the economy is self-regulating, and that is to mean markets can achieve maximum employment and growth on their own. According to this classical theory, there are self-adjusting mechanisms in the market that rebalance the economy back to the natural level of the GDP. We must, however, remember that the rise of classical economic theory came at a time when Western capitalism and the Industrial Revolution were the order of the day, and there was an overall rejection of government interference in the economy. Classical economies wanted to transition away from a class-based monarchist system in favor of a loser market strategy, something they call laissez-faire. The second angle is found in the writings of John Maynard Keynes, the English economist, during the 1930s and 1940s, which challenged the classical theory of laissez sphere. A little known fact about Keynes is that when the South African Reserve Bank was being established in the early 1920s, Chancellor, Jan Smart, who was Prime Minister then, asked him to be part of the committee that helped to select our first governor of the South African Reserve Bank, 
Mr. William Henry Clegg. Keynes battled against this laser spare mindset and would later go on to lay bare his ideas of this school of thought in the seminal work titled The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. Now, the economy students would know that. That was basically a homage to Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, if you recall that. Keynesians placed the greater role of, for expansionary fiscal policy with government that must spend through, that can influence the economy through spending and taxes. Economic historians have labeled the period 1951 to 1973 as the golden age of Keynes due to the relatively high average global growth, low unemployment, reduction of economic inequality, and the lowering of public debt. Now, I lived through this period, and I can attest to the fact that during those times, there was very little economic crisis globally. So therefore, the Keynesian school is often associated with an interventionist approach. And this is important because I want to come back to it at the closing of this address. Finally, the monetary school of thought that was introduced by Professor Milton Friedman from Chicago believed that government intervention in the form of government spending caused inflation. I entered business school in America during the mid-1970s, around the period that Dr. Friedman's policies were a huge source of discussion and debate amongst many of us, the students. Monetarists placed emphasis on the role of money and its supply and demand in the economy. Dr. Milton, the Nobel Prize, Prize winner, became tied to the school following his seminal work in a paper titled Studies in the Quantity Theory of Money. And by the way, he also did a 100-year study of the American economy from 1867 to 1960 to study the concept of money supply and growth and demand. Milton argued that in the long run, growth in money supply will increase prices, but has little or zero effect on the growth of the economy. In the short run though, growth in money supply causes employment and output to increase. Dr. Friedman believed that monetary policy was so important to the health of an economy that he publicly blamed the Federal Reserve Bank for causing the Great Depression implying that it is up to the Federal Reserve to regulate the economy. Both the Keynesian and Monetary School of Thought directly impacted the way in which policymakers in governments today continue to craft their policies. Now, there are certain nuances of between all different schools that should be considered, and I'd like to briefly discuss those. But ultimately, an argument for public intervention, in other words, government intervention in the economy, especially during crunch times, makes sense to me, and it should make it to you as well. I will now briefly argue for the intervention of the government in this economy in order to allay the problems of what was earlier described as a collapsing economy. Before the rise of classical economics, economics most economies followed a top-down command con and control sort of monarchic government policy. And we have learned from what I've just said that uh, about how classical economists favored minimal intervention by the public sector. They considered the core activities 
of the public sector of the government to be limited to the provision of essential services like building hospitals, schools and clinics, the maintenance of law and order, and the defense of the country. According to the classical economies, that was the only role of government. But in the classical mo model, in the classical model, the economy can be seen as free-flowing, as we said, and prices and wages adjust freely to the ups and downs of demand over time. In other words, when times are good, wages and prices quickly go up, and when times are bad, wages and prices freely adjust downward. Now, the major assumption of this model is that the economy is always at full employment, meaning that all resources are utilized to full capacity. And this is not always the case, I argue, and other, others will. And the situation here in South Africa today affirms this notion. Note that the Keynesian school was born during and after the Great Depression. Keynes had argued that the depression was caused by lower aggregate demand in the economy which contributed to a sharp decline in income and employment. As such, the economy would reach equilibrium at low levels of econ economic activity and high employment. Under the circumstances, therefore, there is a strong case for government intervention. That is, governments should borrow more to offset the fall of spending in the private sector and to give tax cuts as well as breaks. For example, people like Paul Samuelson and Richard Musgrave introduced the concept of a public good, which means that the government must provide for such good. This implied that without intervention, the market would undersupply such public goods. Today, Apart from the usual monetary and fiscal policy interventions, we need to, need to call on our government to fulfill an even larger social and developmental role, including infrastructure development. The earlier literature on economic development assumed that governments had the abilities that were lacking in the private sector, such as large amounts of cash and capital and expertise. But this view does not hold true today. Some even argue that resources can be greatly misallocated, often as a result of ineffective government policies, inefficient administrators, or just a pure lack of funding, which is often misdirected. So, Going towards the end, let's deal with the role of government and SOEs. I come from an SOE, as you heard before, but a well-managed and competitive one, the Development Bank of South Africa. To further illustrate the case for more government intervention, countries today, especially developing, developing economies, continue to rely heavily on the public sector to provide basic services. To overcome the burden of inefficiencies, countries such as ours have created what we call state-owned entities with specialized skills to extend the government's ability to deliver services. And some countries have also advocated for more public-private partnerships in the developmental and infrastructure space. This approach seeks to share responsibility between the state and the private sector and effectively optimize the strengths that both parties bring to the table while holding each other accountable, which they should. And of course, lately we have heard about how government is thinking about advocating for such public-private partnerships. In our country, the government has often intervened into the economy through spending, through relief and social upliftment, even though over the past 29 years, since democracy, governments increased by over 1,000 percent from 120 billion in 1994 in, to 1.6 trillion today. Although that's the case, 
the economy is still far from solving unemployment, inequality, and poverty and child. All of these market failures must be re rectified in the economy. And development financial institutions are specifically created to play this role. Whether this is happening sufficiently, I will not debate this at uh, this function. It's safe or not to. Despite ongoing government resource allocation concerns, DFIs continue to be ideally situated chancellor to play a role in a key one at that in a high risk long term capital phase, capital funding space, while commercial banks go on with their job of focusing on short-term funding because they are faced with lowered risk in that arena. In times of crisis and when it matters most, they have the capacity to appropriate funding and support social and economic development. Finally, I would be remiss not to continue to advocate for a more vigorous application of the use of public procurement to drive the government's policy of broad-based black economic empowerment. If you have heard me say that before, please know that I will still say it tomorrow. I am quite encouraged by the meaningful inclusion of black-owned as well as women-owned entities, Chancellor, in the Renewable Energy IPP Procurement Program Round 5 of 2021. Once again, this has been made possible by the intervention of some DFIs which have provided the required planning, the required project preparation, as well as significant funding for broad-based black entities and women-owned companies. In conclusion, I'd like to just state that the counter-cyclical role of government intervention, especially in times of crisis and when private sector, private sector participation is limited, cannot be overemphasized. Let me now turn my attention to the graduating class of 2022. You must be heartily congratulated for the hard work you have put in your studies and, and generally the work you have put in whatever you did. The years of hardship, the years of turmoil, I might remind you, it's often at great cost to your parents and your sponsors and yourselves have paid off today. We are proud of your achievements and look forward to you taking your rightful place in society to make anticipated contributions to your communities and the country at large. Let me tell you this. Yesterday as I drove this way towards the university and I went past all the rolling hills as well as the massive sugarcane fields of the north coast of KZN, and as I passed the homestead of the late Chief Albert Lutuli, I couldn't but recall the words of Senator Robert Kennedy, the Democrat congressman from New York, who when he was here met Chief Albert Lutuli in 1966. Speaking at the University of Cape Town, Robert Kennedy had this to say, and I quote, each time, and this applies more to our graduates, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, that man or woman sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy, those ripples 
build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. That was called. This last of 2022, Chancellor, here before us, must strive to send out that ripple of hope to all of, to our challenged country. Go out there and heal the mindless violence that has gripped our nation. Accelerate economic progress. Liberate the capacity of human talent that your studies have cultivated in you. Help to re-energize our moribund economies and industries. Seek not to emulate our errors by acquiring business stakes in other people's businesses, but rather create that which is your own. It is you, the young people of this country, who must take the lead now. Eradicate ignorance and become beacons of light. Remember, upon you is thrust a greater burden of responsibility to fix that which future, previous generations, like my own, has broken. If you do that and inspire yourself with a vision of enlightenment, you and those who follow will be hugely rewarded. Go out and be that tiny ripple of hope because history is always the final judge of our deeds. I thank you, Madam Chancellor. Thank <clears throat> you.